Let me just talk a little bit about, by, let me just start out by talking to you about a couple of different pictures here. I was, this was a few years ago, I was working for IBM as the program director and global brand strategist for the WebSphere brand at, at uh, IBM. And I, that was a, a few weeks into my job. So, okay, I was, um, so my boss, who is a VP of marketing, was based out of Armonk, New York, New York. And I was based out of uh, Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. And she asked for, part of my job was to present a global brand strategy for the, uh, global brand strategy for that brand, the WebSphere brand. So I pulled together a lot of data, talked to a lot of customers, talked to a lot of um, our marketing folks as well as product development people, and talked to a lot of my colleagues and put together this, what I thought was a very, very comprehensive and um, strategic document. And so we arranged a conference call, and I sent the deck to my boss, who was in um, Armonk, and I was in North Carolina, and surrounded in a conference table with a lot of my colleagues. And five pages into it, uh, into the document, taking her through the uh, deck, she was, let me just tell you a little bit about what she was like. She, um, she, had a gorgeous, she had gorgeous blonde hair all the way down to her waist, really beautiful, full, curly, wavy um, hair. She had a PhD in biomechanical engineering or something like that, something very intimidating. <laughs> and, um, and she was, um, so she was very, highly regarded among uh, top leaders at IBM. And she would come here to work, come to work in her black leather jacket and leather pants on her Harley Davidson. So, <laughs> so that's, that's how she um, came to work. And for the rest of us, we were sitting in the conference room around the table with that three-legged conference phone. You, some of you probably don't know what I'm, I mean, do know what I'm talking about. So, so we were sitting around, and five pages into my deck, she goes, she had a French accent. She goes, you know, Suni, I have, un I have more knowledge under my big toenail than you do in the brain of yours. Oh. <laughs> I'm not kidding. These are word for word what she said. And spontaneously, I wasn't even thinking, tears started streaming down my face. And I thought, whoa, did I just hear what I thought I heard? And I was just reeling from the impact of what I just heard. And then the guy that was sitting next to me, he was a, a director of product marketing. He hurriedly tried to find the mute button, and then he pushed on it, and he goes, oh, I forgot to warn you, that's her standard line. She says that to everybody. And I'm like, whoa, second shock. <laughs> so I somehow got through the deck, got, got through the document, and a few weeks later, her and her um, assistant came down from New York for a meeting. So I got to talk to her assistant, and she says, you know, Sunny, just between you and me, I've never seen so many grown men walking, out of some, walking into somebody's office coming out crying. <laughs> I heard that. I'm like, why are these people, why is she kept on her position? Why, why do they tolerate this? And I also heard from many, many other people that she, um, she would just chew her people out and she would just terrorize people. She would you know, reign with terror. That's what I heard. And I thought, this is really bizarre. Why, why is she being kept on her position? Why is this happening? And uh, later on, I found the answer. It's because she was delivering her results every quarter. So. Whatever, however she got there, she was delivering the results. So that's why she was able to get away with a lot of things. And uh, a few months later, I left the company because I got recruited by Samsung to work for, uh, to, uh, to head up their global brand strategy department. So I went to Seoul, Korea um, as an expatriate. So I left IBM to go there. And 
I still kept in touch with a lot of my colleagues from IBM after that, and I heard that a few months later I left. She actually left IBM to go work for Gateway as the CMO. And I don't know if you guys know the Gateway culture. It's, it's no longer, but it's just um, th their, their culture is that it's very family friendly and very collegial. <laughs> Nine months later, she was let go from that position. So the moral of the story is that that left such a huge impact on me. I was, it, it, so when, when I was treated that way, and she was still able to get away with that, and I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't make sense of it. But I thought, wow, there are people like that who are leaders over a, a, a lot of people. And that's, a, it's a type of leadership, I don't know, this is really different. Is that, is that kind of how, how it is with the rest of the company? And later on found that that's not the case. IBM actually has a lot of good leaders. She was an anomaly. So that's one picture. That's one, one end of the spectrum. So let me tell you about another end of the spectrum. Um, this is a pretty, uh, it's a pretty common picture that we come across uh, sadly to say, in this part of Utah, where we're struggling to get through college, and then maybe, maybe you, you graduate from college, but you don't have a lot of ambition, because you have children now, or you feel like, as, as, a, as a woman, your place in society is kind of limited, and especially the, the role model that we have in Utah is, okay, around here is not that it's going in and out. <laughs> so, is that working? oh, it's not. Okay, then now it's working. Okay, so yeah, and so we don't have a lot of ambition. So, well, today I'm gonna do this, and then just you know make it work. And as long as I am kind of busy, but I have my children, or I am going to have my children, so I better not start something really big. So I can't really commit myself to it. So we'll just do whatever in the meantime, until I get married. And once I get married, then, you know, then I don't, I don't want to hold a job. I want to stay home and t you know, take care of the children. So as a result, they don't expect a lot out of themselves. They don't expect a lot um, in terms of the goals they can set for themselves and the, um, the accomplishments they make, they can make from, from life. So on one spectrum, there's per this person who totally uh, pushes themselves onto others to a point where they're not, they're, re they're breaking respectful boundaries of other people. On the other end of the spectrum is somebody who doesn't push enough themselves, pu push themselves enough. You see the spectrum here? The picture doesn't have to be one or the other. It's somewhere in between where that's ideal, where that's, you can have your cake and eat it too, okay? So hopefully that's part of what we will discuss and that's part of what you can, what you can do to make that happen tonight. So I'm not sure if I'm connected to this now, because I need, I need the screen. That's okay. So, well, we're gonna have to, I need the pictures, but let's just work with, use your imagination. <laughs> okay, so let me tell you a little bit about some statistics here. Half of the leaders, uh, based on uh, the recent research, half of the people that um, are working in the corporate America, professionals, Half of them report that they're reporting to bad leaders. They're working for bad leaders. Bad is a relative term. And um, another research cites that the cost of a derailed leader on average at the senior level is $1 million per person for the company. 
So think about that. As a senior leader, you bring this person in, you pay a lot of money, because there's a switching cost involved when you bring somebody in at a high level, yeah? And there's a relocation involved, and there's a lot of um, you know, upfront bonus involved. So it's, it's not surprising that, that when the leader gets derailed, it costs the company a million dollars. And that's, that's a recent research brought by Hogan and Associates. And also think about the impact on employee turnover. The research suggests, the research suggests that when people quit their jobs, they don't quit their jobs, actually they quit their bosses. Because bosses have a lot higher, greater impact on the person than the company itself um, or how well the company is doing. Your personal relationship, day-to-day -day relationship interaction with your boss has a, a lot greater impact on that person. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And it also has a huge effect on coworkers. One-third of um, our employees from the recent employee, uh, employee engagement research suggests that one-third of them are not engaged. Of them, 20% are actively disengaged. What that means is they detract people, other people around them from focusing or working hard or being motivated by spreading their negative energy by being, by, with their cynicism with their negativity. So when you have people like that around you, oh yeah, it's gonna bring you down. Those people are called actively disengaged. And it has a huge impact on the company. So, and then I will talk about why that's the case. Why that negative or positive energy spreads. There's a scientific, neuroscientific research behind it, the reason behind it, I'll talk about that. And also, we, um, so bec all these things are happening. So I want you to think about the impact. At the same time, when you do the 360 degree uh, uh, leadership feedback, because I'm an executive coach and leadership consult and consultant, I'll go into companies and then we do three, 360 um, assessment. About 85% of them say they're the good boss. So there's something missing here, right? The overall research says half of them are bad bosses, but when you actually research, I mean, uh, uh, survey them, 85% of them that think that they're good bosses. Okay, so there's a disconnect. So we're gonna talk about a little bit, uh, talk a little bit about what makes a good boss, what makes a bad boss, and why is there a disconnect? And what can we do now to take advantage of and capitalize on the strengths that are already within us as women so that we can, we can become better leaders. And I'm gonna make a um, claim to you tonight, supported by solid neuroscience research, that women are actually born to be better leaders than men. <laughs> So there are a lot of uh, scientific um, support behind it, and I will talk about that. So knowing that, I want you to walk away with courage, hope, and resolve to become better leaders, not just to lead your little family, which is very important, but you can expand out to your community, to the whatever workplace um, career that you have, expand your influence. It's already within us. You don't have to go get it or earn it. It's already within us. We just didn't realize we had it. Okay? Okay, to start with, Oh, I really wish I had that. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, so I want you to take a, I want this to be a dialogue, conversation tonight, not just me just talking to you. I want to talk with you. So I would like you to take a piece of paper and write three traits of your worst boss. The worst boss you've ever had. 
write down three traits. I'm going to give you a couple minutes to write that down. Does anybody need more time? Do you have it? Can you just kind of call out what those attributes are? Micromanager. Micromanager. Gossiper. Sorry? Gossips. Gossips, okay. Condescending. Sorry? Condescending. Uninformed. 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 Are you talking about technical knowledge? Technical knowledge? Okay. Okay. Arrogant. Arrogant. Who said that? Okay. Disrespectful. Sorry? Disrespectful. Disrespectful. Demanding. Demanding. I'm sorry? Oh, unclear expectations, okay. Okay, we have a lot. See, you can tell there's a pent up <laughs> frustration about bad bosses. Yes, there are. Okay, tell me more. Sorry? Oh, had an agenda, alternate agenda. She wasn't very transparent. Okay, what else? Oh, didn't believe in you. Okay. Lazy. What else? Threatened, felt threatened, okay. No communication. No communication, okay. Yeah, back there. Lying. Sorry? Telling lies. Oh, telling lies, okay. Yeah. Not an advocate of people manager. Oh, not an advocate then, oh, of people and, and not a people manager. Favorites. Played favorite and yeah, favorites, okay. Back there, hold, hold on. Oh, lacking in self-awareness. That's a big one. Okay, over there. Oh. Right. Right. Okay. Believing they own you, and um, they are, they talk. Basically, they are talking down to you with an attitude. Yeah. There's something else. Anybody else? Oh, <laughs> yeah, okay, right, all the bad things are documented, but not, not so much your, the, all the good things that you've done, yeah? Like bully. bully, okay, back there, somebody else over there? Assuming the worst intention. Okay, got it, assuming the worst intention, yes, another one? Taking yeah, taking credit for your work, and they don't, they don't share credit with the rest of the team. Okay. Anybody else? I had a boss that was threatened by me, and so he's stripped away all my responsibilities. Mm, somebody who will feel threatened. Okay. Anybody else? Unrealistic deadlines. Unrealistic deadlines. Very demanding. Bossy. Yeah? Bossy is boss. Okay, okay bossy, I guess. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah? Inappropriate boundaries. Okay. What do you mean by that? Uh, like really, really revealing clothing. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm, okay. All right. Okay. So I think we can go on and on and on. But I think th you get the sense, right? You get an idea of what makes what makes people think that somebody's a bad boss. Yeah. You kind of get the idea. Now put that away. Just kind of make make a note of it. Put it away for a minute. So now let me tell you a little bit about our human brain. I wish we had a picture, but. We are just going to have to use your imagination and you follow my hand. I'm going to share with you the hand model of the brain, okay? And this is by Dr. Daniel Siegel. Um, he's, a, he's a medical doctor out of the UCLA Medical School. And this is, he, he, uh, this is his model to explain the brain. I love it, so I'm going to use it tonight. So this is our spine here. And this, my fist is our brain. Okay, closest to the spine at the very bottom, the back brain right here, right here, closest to the spine that's connected to the spine right here. This is a reptilian brain, or another name for it is a brain stem. This part of the brain, what it does is it function, it governs our organs under the subconsciousness. So your beating of your heart and all that stuff. When, imagine, you run into somebody like you know your high school friend um, on the street, and you guys, you're so happy to see her, and you go, oh, "I am so happy to see," you. and you forget to forget, forget to beat your heart, heart. What happens then? You would pass out, yeah. So all that stuff, the the functioning of governing of organs that has to be done under the subconsciousness, in the subconscious. You can't, it can't be left to your conscious brain. It has to be automatic. 
Okay? Same thing with that. Anything that's related to your survival is being governed by here. So your sex drive, your drive to eat, drink, anything that's directly related to your survival gets governed here. Oh, so we, we're going to have a good alternative here. <laughs> Thank you for helping us. OK. And that's the part of the brain that we have in common with reptiles, the lizard brain. You've probably heard that term before, yeah? Right here. So now, follow where my thumb is. Right here, this is the limbic system. This is a limbic system. This part of the brain is next to layer, layer up, meaning it's more e evolved than the reptilian brain. And this part of the brain is in charge of attachment, feeling connected to people, right? Attachment, memory, and emotions. And this is part of the brain we have in common with mammals. So when, and this is why we feel attached to cats and dogs, and they feel attached to us, but snakes and turtles don't feel attached to us. Even if we keep them as pets, we take care of them because they don't have this limbic system. This part of the brain, you need to have this part, limbic system to feel attached, okay? Again, this part of the brain governs memory, attachment, and emotions. Next layer up. This is the, the, prefer this is the cortex brain. The prefrontal cortex, that's, that's the most evolved part of the brain. This is what we have in common with primates. This part of the brain governs logic and reasoning, rational thinking, and decision making. OK, of the, the, the prefrontal cortex, this is what we have in common with primates. Of that, where my two knuckles are right here, two middle two fingers, that's the medial prefrontal cortex. And that is right behind our eyeballs. And this is the part of the brain that governs Functions such as empathy, attunement, emotion regulation, fear modulation, insight, ethical and moral reasoning. All of those things. So think about having a relationship with somebody who doesn't have those things. Somebody who can't manage their emotions and totally dumps on you somebody who is not ethical, so they lie and cheat on you? Can you imagine having a relationship with somebody like that? It's going to be very challenging, yeah? So this is the part of the brain, actually, where humans have the thickest part. So we are as, this is what I, I want to say, the word you, that what makes us uniquely human. There are some primates who have these functions, but they're not as well developed as it is with them, with us as humans. So think about the implication of what I just told you. When we can be uniquely human, when we are uniquely human, we are the happiest. When we can maximize our unique humanness, we can become the happiest and feel most fulfilled. And those functions I just told you about happen to be top leadership attributes to be successful. So now let's talk about then, if that's the case, and if, we, if research, research says 50% of leaders are bad leaders, what makes them bad leaders? What happens to them? Because I'm sure nobody starts out thinking, oh, I'm, today I'm going to be a bad leader. So what happens? Let me tell you about what happens in our brain. The, 
we have all the sensory input is concentrated on our faces, right? On our, on our face. What we see, what you hear, what you smell, what you taste, what you, all that is concentrated on here, closest to the brain. The role of our brain, what do you think our, the role of function of our brain is? What does it do? What, what is its purpose? Somebody said something? Interprets data. Yes, that's, yeah, that's one of the three functions. What other two functions? Keep you alive. Sorry? Keep you alive, okay. Okay, what else? Yes, exactly, that's the this, this third part. So basically, it perceives, and then it interprets it. Perceives signals from the environment, it interprets the, uh, the signals, meaning it assigns a meaning to it. And then you react to it. It governs a reaction. That's what our brain does. That's why all the sensory input is concentrated on, on, on the brain, the closest. It's not at the, you know, here or in the back. It's right here, closest to the brain. So, all the sensory input gets captured in thalamus in our brain. Thalamus captures all those um, sensory input. And in eight milliseconds, that's one millisecond is one thousandth, thousandth of a second. So it's like, whoo, super fast. In eight milliseconds, the signal goes from thalamus to the amygdala. Amygdala is part of this limbic system, limbic brain, and it's very, very intricately and very closely connected to the brain stem. Okay, it's like joined at the hip, amygdala is, because its job is to c connect with it, activate the brain stem to, to protect you. So amygdala has this implicit memory bank. What that means is when it, it has the, all the memories of what it perceived to be a threat to our existence, to our survival, and it remembers those things in the memory, implicit memory bank. And it's not an explicit memory bank, meaning what we talk about here tonight, you will probably go home and remember it, it's because it's stored in the hippocampus. It's a different part of, the, part of your brain. It's a different part. But amygdala remembers it. And not only does it remember the explicit thing that happened, but it remembers everything about that situation. So that, and then it, it remembers uh, and it put, it stores all that information in the memory network. Not just one neuron, but in the memory network. Um, there's an aphorism in our field, a neuroscience field, that says that what fires together, wires together. They're talking about neurons. Okay, when the neurons fire together, w then it gets wired together. So let's think about that. Let's say you are a fourth grader. You came home from school so excited about something, to, excited to share something with your mom. You go, Mom, Mom, guess what happened at school today? And you, your mom, probably at the end of the really long day, she was tired and she still sits back in the couch and she's got a paper in her hand and she doesn't even take her eyes off of her paper. And she goes, I'm glad you're at home. Go get an ice cream. It's in the freezer. Okay? Let's say she said that. And there's a certain music playing in the background. And let's say that got repeated more than a few times. Okay? Sorry, I'm going to shut this down. <laughs> okay, and then what that, when that, so what happens is that because your brain thinks that you, your survival depends on your ability to secure your mom's at affection, attention, and approval, when you don't get it, you feel like you are, your, your survival is threatened. So that your amygdala gets kicked in, and then it remembers. So it's going to remember ice cream, after school, it's a school, newspaper, mom, fridge, all of that into one neural network. Let's say 15 years later, you go to somebody's house for a party, and there's the same music that's playing in the background. You have no idea, because you, you don't have direct access to the implicit memory. But because it's the same music, your back brain remembers. 
Oh, yeah. And then you're going to feel activated and you feel agitated. You go, oh, I don't know what's going on. I, just, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be here. I don't feel good. I'm going to go home. You have no idea what just happened. This thing happens every day. Okay? So that's the role of the implicit, implicit memory. So the sensory input comes in from a thalamus. And in eight milliseconds, the input goes to the amygdala. Amygdala has the, this implicit memory bank with all these things that it remembered to be a threat to your safety. Then it has a rapid appraisal. Is it safe? Incoming is signal. Is it safe or not? Safe, safe, safe. Okay, pass, pass, pass. Whoa, there's a match. Once there's a match and it perceived to be threatening, then it our body goes through an extraordinary process of HPA axis. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. We have no idea how taxing it is on our bodies and the subcon you know, the conscious mind, but it really is very taxing on our on our bodies. So let me tell you about that. So by the way, if the in incoming signal is safe, then we can activate the, the social network. The social network is tend and befriend meaning it's nurturing, it's open, and when you're in that environment, you're naturally releasing your, your capabilities for caring other people. Um, creativity, innovation, drive, all that, and your pursuit of excellence. We all have in a drive to be better people tomorrow than we are today. We all have that innately. So when you, feel, when you feel like incoming signals are safe, then you can activate that tend and befriend and then open and nurturing, that kind of an environment. But once there's a match to the amygdala implicit memory that says, this is not safe, then it activates the HPA axis. So what that means is, the, um, let me tell you, let me, I will tell you more about it in the next slide, but let's, let's just say it activates our, you know, our survival system, fight, flight, or freeze system. The next question is, okay, this is safe? Okay, then tend to befriend, but it's not safe. The next question is, can I fight and take this on and have a fair chance of winning? Then you're going to fight. Okay? So if the answer is no, okay, then what's the next thing? Next best option, can I, can I run? Can I run away and get away? If the answer is yes, then you're going to flight. But if the answer is no, you have no other option. You are going to die, basically. Then what do you do? You defecate and you, par you get paralyzed and you pass out. This is an evolutionary design because predators don't eat rotten meat, so you pass out and playing dead in the hopes that you will, it, the, the, um, the predator won't eat you. But this actually happens to us today in a different form. People get totally paralyzed and then they, they get, um, I had a client, let me tell you about this. I'm gonna you know, um, weave in a lot of stories from my practice so you can see what the impact is on a, in a real life. She was a VP of product, uh, he was a VP of product development and he came in and he said, I need some, I need some help because they, he was looking for, some coach, um, looking for a coach. So what he was saying is that he was, um, he was a very, um, he had a huge potential, really prominent and up and coming promising uh, leader in the company. But starting from about a year ago, he started slipping with his performance. He couldn't get up in the morning even if he got up, he went to work, he wouldn't just, he wouldn't be able to do anything. He was just felt, like he, he said his arms were listless. So he's weren't, he, he couldn't activate himself to do, get mobilized, I mean, mobilize himself to do things. Of course, your performance is gonna suffer when you do that. I started working with him and found out that a year ago, his, um, I mean, his uh, wife started an internet business and it was taken off like a rocket. And she needed more money to, to finance her business. So what did she do? She kept pushing him so that he could, um, he could achieve a you know, higher level of uh, bonus at, at work. 
I need more money. Can you get more money? That type of thing. I need to you know, get this going. I need, I need financing, and I, I don't want to go to the bank. I need you to come up with some money. So his cortex brain is going, make more money. She needs money. But her his back brain is going, what happens if I, she, if I make more money? She's going to take it, and she's going to finance her business, which means it's going to prosper, which means I'm, I'll never see her again. So what does the back brain do? Don't make money. Our brain can't hold two inconsistent messages at the same time. Guess what's going to win out? Your reptilian brain's going to win because it's about survival. Every time it's going to win. But we have no direct access to what's happening in the reptilian brain. That's why he felt listless. He got paralyzed. So these are some of the, the, our evolutionary responses to threats. It's, if the incoming signal is safe, then we open, we engage, activate our social engagement system, and we nurture other people, we become more ethical, we are more in tune with other people, we think about them, we're careful, we're considerate for them. And also, we become more innovative, we become more creative, we, we are very driven. As, as soon as it's, it's an unsafe signal, we fight, flight, or freeze. OK. This is what I just told you about. So the HPA axis. Signal, the, the, and basically, what happens is, at the end, when it, and it doesn't, the threat to your survival doesn't have to be, a, oh, there's a predator in front of me. It's trying to kill me. That is, uh, that is what could have happened in the caveman days. And this, our system, this, this um, uh, defense system, was developed at that time. So, and it got refined and honed in over a millions, of, uh, millions of years. And so it's very, very good at its job of keeping us safe. Sometimes it's overactive. So when it doesn't have to be a threat, threatening situation, it perceives to be a threatening situation. Okay, it's rather be safe than sorry, basically. That's what that is. Okay, so let me tell you about what happens. So when, there's a, when our body perceives something to be a threat, it doesn't have to be about something big, it can be a, a stressful situation, okay? Just like when I first came in here and then it wasn't connected and it wasn't working, I'm like, oh, I need to show this and it's not working. That triggers my stress system, okay? And you go home and uh, one of your children is not going to bed and just you know, screaming his head off. Then it's gonna activate your stress system, okay? So it doesn't have to be about something really big, like you know, real threat to your survival, but it's a, it, it activates the same system. All right, so, and when that happens, a few hormones and neurotransmitters get activated. Cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine. These are all um, neurotransmitters slash hormones that get activated in your brain when you are, when, when you are under a stress or threatening situation. Research found, found, I mean, researchers found out when you are in that situation, our peripheral vision typically is 180 degrees and 230 degrees when there's nothing else happening. But as soon as our brain perceived this to be a stressful stress situation, our peripheral vision gets reduced to 30 degrees because you're just focused on what's right in front of you to take care of this threat to your survival. When that happens, you can only see what's right in front of you. Big tube tunnel. There's a medical term for that. It's called tunnel vision. If this is a medical term. I'm not, this is not just a figure of speech. It's a, it's, a, it's a medical term. When you're in a tunnel vision, you can't consider other people's ideas. You're not open to other people's ideas because you gotta see what's in front of you. And what else, has hap what else hap happens is that blood gets concentrated to 
your arms and legs to equip you, prepare you for fight or flight. So what that means, blood has to come from somewhere. Where is it coming? From your brain and from your guts. So when there's no um, blood to your brain, why is that bad? <laughs> you can't think. Neurons need oxygen. Your thinking brain needs oxygen to think. When you, do, when you don't have blood to your brain, then you can't think. You're just reacting. So you become very inflexible. And your arteries harden to handle an increased blood flow. And what happens when your arteries are in hardening is that it hardens in the momentarily. You, then you become inflexible and hardened as well. Your thinking, thinking ability. So you can't think about other, cap other scenarios, other possibilities. You can't allow the possibility that, that you could be wrong. OK? And because you have to make fast um, the judgments quickly, and then the, the, your ability to detect that, that threat from your environment, from the environment, has to be, has very well de is very well developed. You're very good at this snap judgments, black and white thinking, no degrees of um, you know, gray in the, air, in the middle. And they're hypervigilant because they've been exposed to that threatening situation a lot. These are some of the consequences of chronic stress. When I say stress, it could be stress or um, a threat to your safety, threat to your survival. Human brains, their characteristics, let me cover some of those characteristics of our human brain. It, neurons get stored in neural network. We talked about why when in, in, in any part of one neuron gets activated, the whole thing gets activated. Yeah? Because it has to be fast and you have to be sure, so in, you have to be safe. So any one of them gets activated, the whole thing gets activated to keep you safe. And in the process, it develops neural highways. So basically, let's say you are a, you're living in a caveman days and you go out hunting with a spear one day. You go out and all of a sudden you see some, feel something warm in the back of your head. And you go, what was that? What is that that's warm? And you look back and you, you see this um, a saber toothed tiger that's in front of you. And your eyes go, occipital cord in the, in the um, your brain goes, OK, that's a, a saber-toothed tiger. And then your executive function kicks in, OK, that's bad. Legs, engage, run. All of that takes like a fraction of a second, right? But to the amygdala and the reptilian brain that is in charge of your safety, it goes, whoa, that was too close. You know what? Next time you feel something warm, you just run, OK? So because that, you, need to, you're, you need to bypass, even if it's a millionth of a second, you need to bypass that next time so that you can be safe. That's how your brain gets primed. So now next time you feel something warm, let's say you're getting ready for school, and then your sister puts that like, in a blow dryer in the back of your brain. Your back of the brain goes, whoa, saber tooth tiger, and I'm going to run. That's seriously. That's kind of like that's that's kind of like how what happens, okay? That's how your brain gets primed. Okay. So cognitive distan dissonance is that I what I told you about before. You can't hold two conflicting messages at the same time. So your back brain is always going to win out because it is in charge of survival. Everything else, when, it, when your survival is at stake, everything else is luxury. So there's actually, how many marketers are here tonight? People in the marketing area, okay. So it will make sense, more sense to, to you guys, but um, when I was at IBM, they did a fabulous, just fascinating research. Um, so, and then they applied it to their marketing function, which is that using this brain's um, 
uh, three different layers. They developed, they tested marketing messages appealing to the reptilian brain, appealing to the limbic brain system, appealing to the prefrontal cortex, and they tested them. And every time, let me give you an example. So it, let's say you're selling a PC. A message that's appealing to the cortex brain is that your DO, uh, the DOA rate for this laptop is the highest in the industry. DOA is dead on arrival. That's a quality measure. So which means your, it, it, your DOA rate is the lowest in the industry. What that means is that it's a, the highest quality that you can find in the industry. It, this is appealing to the logic, right? It, this is prefrontal cortex. Another, um, another one is that IBM ThinkPad enables you build a community with your people, with your colleagues. That's appealing to the limbic brain. It's a building community, connection. You feel connected. That's a limbic brain. Another message that's appealing to the, the reptilian brain is this is a, you can be a champion over everybody else when you have this. It's all about survival out in the jungle. We're going to win when you use this. Okay? And guess which message wins out every time? The reptilian brain message, yes. Okay? Even if we, rational brain says, but, oh, but, uh, but your rate is really, really important because that's the high quality. But it, this is all sub, sub, subconscious messages. Marketers are geniuses. They, you know, they, they use these things a lot. They use our psychology. Okay? So, the, in terms of the neuroscience of communication, why is this important? Because remember this, the implicit memory I told you about? We all have that. The, the and we, the network of neurons that are stored in that implicit memory is different for everybody. So what I perceive to be a threat is different than what you, have, you perceive to be a threat. Why would that be the case? Experience. Exper that's exactly right. Your life ex experiences are different than my life experiences. So think about this. Implication is that when I am when, I, when there's an incoming message, and my back brain interprets it as a threat to my survival, and then I go, Woo! and then the other person goes, what's wrong with you? You're overreacting. How, long, how often does it happen? A lot. And then this person judges them, judges her, and, 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 she's, and she's saying, y you are up in the night. You're, you're overreacting. What's wrong with you? And as soon as that message hits, you're not being curious to discover what's happening and what the person is trying to say because you've already made a judgment. This person is not worth listening to because she's overreacting. And what that means is when I see something, a certain thing, let's say, um, and then let's say you're in the canyon and you see something quickly going on, um, across the, uh, the road. You might think if you have grown up in a rural area, then you're going to think that's a rabbit. If you grew up in Manhattan, you're going to think maybe it's a, a ball or something, but not a rabbit. That wouldn't, even, you know, that wouldn't even be a possibility. Everybody has different experiences that constitute a different filter. We all have these filters. And when, the, when we perceive the sensory input from the environment, this filter, it goes through our filter, and that the filter is what gives them gives what you see as a, a, a meaning. That meaning, in turn, generates emotions. Okay, so let's apply this. You go to work, and your boss says. Wow, you, you wrote a really good report. This is the second, second time I, I feel like you've done a really, really good job with this, um, with, 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 with this report. You have two different options to interpret that message. One is, wow, I must have done a really good job. 
this is only a second time, meaning this is like, it, it's that exceptional. I feel good. I feel happy. Would you agree with that? Yeah. There's another way to interpret it, which is that only a second time. Oh my gosh, all this time I've done so many, um, so many, uh, I've made so many doc, I mean, decks, so many documents, and this is only a second time. Wow, I must have done a really crappy job until now, up through now. You see, there are two very different messages. What determines which message to take? Your filters. The filters are determined by your past experiences. So if you're not conscious of your filter, it's going to be automatic. OK? So people communicate, and they converse with, with each other. But it's not really conversing. Because what we're hearing is their words. But you don't understand, underneath that words, there's 95% of them that you don't see. That's in the filter, in the implicit memory. You have no idea. You're just hearing the words, and you're responding to those words. And that's why miscommunication happens. OK? So this is why it's so critical to stay curious and allow the possibility that you could be wrong. Or this person has, there's merit in what this person is saying. I need to be curious, and I need to understand this. I need to discover more. OK, so let me tell you about what happens um, when this, the stress situation happens on a chronic basis. Research, um, found out, researchers found out that when people are, have a chronic stress, little stress, small stresses, small s stresses on a daily basis in the chronic stress, this medial pre prefrontal cortex I told you about gets compromised and gets smaller, very, very small, because all the neurons that, have, that, that should have been allocated to developing, developing this part of the brain got diverted to this fight, flight, or survival instincts down here. So you don't have enough neurons up here. So you have very you know, thin and smaller medial prefrontal cortex. And the re uh, researchers also found out that big T trauma, meaning you s you're a combat veteran, you go out to the field, and you see limbs flying over your head, that's a big T trauma. Or you, 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 know, you have your best friend getting shot in front of you. That's a big T trauma. Those big T traumas and small T traumas, those are like the example I gave you, you come home from school excited about something and your mom doesn't pay attention to you, that constitutes a small s stress. Over time, chronic small, uh, small s stress and small T traumas have the same effect on your brain. So now, think about the implications of that. Medial prefrontal cortex, let me remind you one more time what that does. Empathy, attunement, emotion regulation, fear modulation, response flexibility, moral and ethical reasoning, insight into what other people are feeling and thinking. Do you see what's happening? These are key leadership qualities. And they get compromised because of the cumulative effect of stress, life stress. And, that's, and what I told you about what happens when you have reduced peripheral vision, when you have um, uh, arterial sclerosis, when your hardened, uh, blood vessels harden, then you become inflexible, and they become judgmental, and black and white thinking from that, um, um, the quick appraisal they need to make, threat appraisal, and they're hypervigilant. They're not trusting. Now I want you to think about the revisit the bad boss characteristics, the three attributes that you wrote down in the beginning of our session together. Raise your hand if your intensity of dislike for that person went down. <laughs> you, 
Yeah, typically that's what happens. Because now you have more empathy. You understand what happened to this person. You might not know the details, but from this person's reaction, you can kind of imagine what could have happened to that person. You have no idea how he grew up or she grew up. But you, what you know is the symptoms that this person is displaying that makes you think that this person is a bad boss are consistent with stress, uh, the stress, uh, stress responses. There are three big patterns of chronic um, childhood stresses. One is insecure attachment to your parents. There's inconsistent or insecure attachment. Another one is parentification, meaning you grew up as a little adult. You started taking adult responsibilities at an age when you were not developmentally ready. Okay, and then another one is that you didn't have that social network where it, you, you and then you didn't um, share, you didn't get to share your emotions openly. What it means, what happens when you share your emotion is that children think that their emotions are a natural part of them, and when their emotions don't get validated, they think that they are not worthy of validation they internalize it to their core self-concept and that constitutes stress. So we have no idea how these people grew up, but you can, t you can see what the, what the, how they're behaving is consistent with some of the symptoms of chronic stress. Parentification, making a parent out of a child. Okay? And we are, so I talked about insecure attachment. So how do we build secure connection, secure attachment? There's an, another aphorism among psychologists to study attachment, human attachment. It goes like this. God didn't give us fangs or claws, but he gave us mirror neurons and need for attachment. Why? Think about that, okay. God didn't give us fangs or claws, but he gave us mirror neurons and a need for attachment. That's what keeps us safe, keeps us surviving. Think about that. We are the most dominant species on this planet, but we don't have fangs or claws. We have much bigger predators a lot more ferocious, but we are more evolved. It's because we, it's a bioevolutionary design. We have this need for attachment where I say, I got your back, you got my back. I will take care of you, I'll risk my life for you, and you will do, I know you'll do the same. That's what keeps us safe. When you have that unquestionable attachment with people, then you can relax, and you can release your innate Drive, creativity, innovation, pursuit of excellence. You can do all of that. We already have all that. Oh, God didn't give us fangs or claws, but he gave us mirror neurons and a need for attachment. Let me tell you about mirror neurons. There are a few researchers that were studying, uh, studying what happens to uh, the, the brain um, using macaque, I mean, uh, uh, it, uh, it's called macaque mm, monkeys. It's a type of monkey. So they wire these uh, monkeys up and then they put it onto fMRI. It's a functional uh, mirror uh, uh, magnetic resonance imaging. So, okay, that's what it was, fMRI uh, machine. So, and what they found out is that there's, there's a, this, this um, monkey that's right in front, of, in front of the researcher, and when the researcher pulled out a peanut to give it to him, the part of the monkey's brain that controlled the motor um, activity for take the arm lit up, which makes sense because it's going to you know, extend the hand and then get it, and then the part of the brain that um, perceived pleasure from eating. 
lit up, which makes sense, yes? Because it's uh, it, anticipating it's going to get it, so it's happy. What really startled the researchers was that there's a second monkey being ready, but being you know, hooked up to a different MRI, fMRI machine for a different purpose, just waiting there for its turn. But the same thing happened to this monkey. The monkey knew it wasn't going to give it to him. The, the, the peanut was give, being given this, to this monkey, but why is the same thing happening to this monkey? And that's the beginning of how the researchers discovered mirror neurons. Primates have mirror neurons. Mirror, the function of these mirror neurons is to detect the intentions and, and emotions of another person. We have that. We have more, a lot more of it. Okay? Because we have this mirror neurons, again, it's designed. It's an evolutionary design. It's built in us so that we can tune into each other. So we can, it can strengthen our attachment with each other. And oxytocin, let me tell you about the hormone oxytocin. Have you ever heard of that? You've probably heard what that is, right? The oxytocin, you've heard, heard that. It's a um, love hormone, basically. It's a hormone that gets um, secreted when you're nursing, as well as when you are experiencing an orgasm. It's the same hormone. And that's the same hormone that gets act activated when you hug or even shake hand, any type of physical touch. And when, what happens when, you, um, when oxytocin gets activated? There's more hope. You nurture, you, you, know, you tend and befriend, and you are more optimistic, you're more generous. Okay, and you take care of each other. And researchers also found out that the brain, where it experiences physical pain, gets activated when there's social rejection. When you experience social rejection, you actually e experience pain. So you some of you probably experienced um, uh, being broken up by, by with somebody else who dumped you, basically. How, think about how much that hurt you. If you haven't experienced any, any, a pain like that, good for you. You don't want to experience it. <laughs> but you know what it feels like, yeah? It hurts. Your heart really physically hurts. It's the same because it's experiencing a physical pain. OK, so what does that all tell us? Think about that. Would you rather report to somebody who nurtures you, takes care of you, takes, the, takes you under her, her or his wing, and looks out for you? Make sure that you go to all your continuing education conferences and, and education opportunities. And um, ha have this mentoring relationship with you and, and, um, and it coaches you, mentors you. Or somebody who's hypervigilant, feels threatened by you, and takes away your authority. You see what's happening here? When you have oxytocin, and when you have this um, the safety, feeling of safety, sense of safety, by re relying on the functions of the limbic system, you become better, bo better bosses. And women, oxytocin is a women hormone, basically. Men hormone is testosterone. <laughs> testosterone is attacking, and it's, uh, it's, it makes you feel threatened. So from a purely neuroscientific and evolutionary point of view, women have better capabilities to be better leaders, more, you know, stronger capabilities to be better leaders. Let me tell you a little bit about then what makes good bosses from my latest research. Some of you participate in um, this research, and this is a preliminary phase. And I'm sorry, not all of you were able to participate. So um, I tested 74 leadership attributes. And 
in the this is from the the, the findings from the preliminary uh, the preliminary phase and the analysis and summary of this research is being published on Harvard Business Review in a few weeks. Of the 74, number one most important attribute is self-organization. My boss makes me, lets me, gives me a broad guidelines and an end goal, but gives me, lets me self-organize to get there. How does that resonate with you? Yes? Somebody who believes in you and you, go, run with it. I know you can do this. You can, you're going to fly with this. Go run with it. Versus somebody who's micromanaging and co constantly watching over your head and shoulders and, well, that, that's not correct. Avoid, do it this way. Hmm. Do you, you get the picture? That's the most number one important attribute is to, self, to let them self-organize. Yes? They're allowing their employees to, to self-organize. So, yeah. Are you going to have this on a website so that people can reimburse this? Uh, the website will be up and running. Actually, this is a protected. Uh, the, the, it's, gonna, it's being filmed right now, so you will have access to all of everything that's being filmed right now. So you will have access to it that way, yes. OK. So. Self-organization, this is, a, if you are a people manager, this is the most number one thing that people cry out for. Let me self-organize. Let me get there on my own. Just give me broad guidelines and the end goal. But how I get there, please let, it, let me self-organize on that. Yeah? What's the second most important thing? is that my boss has high ethical and moral standards, as well as oh. my boss clearly communicates expectations. What do those two things have in common? High moral and ethical standards and clear expectations. What do they have in common? Sorry, say it again. Um, they understand the expectations they have for themselves, mm -hmm. and so that helps them in setting expectations for other people. Yeah, go ahead. People come from the legal sense of what Sorry? People come from that sense of what Oh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so th yeah. Basically, as an employee, uh -huh. Exactly. It's safe. It's safe. It's safe. When you know what rules of the game you're playing by, you know how to win. You know what to expect. But when, you, when, you know, when your boss is not ethical, you have no idea how to win because you could be doing your be very best, but it's depending on the whim of the day, it's not going to work. It's not safe. You don't know what to expect. Same thing with clear expectations. You have no idea how you can win. OK, that's why that's important. And next, we are almost running out of time. We, so I'm going to have to hurry through this. Uh, response flexibility, it makes, um, he, this person is open and flexible and allows me to make mistakes along the way, knowing that mistakes are part of the way. The failure is, uh, is a you know, part of the, uh, uh, it's a, a weight on the way to success. It, it's inevitable that you're going to fail. You're going to try, you're going to try it, you know, practice trial and error, and you're going to make mistakes here and there. That's, that's a given. Allowing that. Okay? The next thing is connection and belonging. We talked about that, how important that is. When you create connection and belonging with your people, they feel safe, 
and then you can unleash their innate creativity, innovation, their resolve to be better, um, and then um, being driven. All of that, it's already there. And next thing is growth, nurturing, and training. My boss takes, is committed to my continuing education and it um, and nurtures me to uh, to grow me uh, is trying to grow me to a next generation leader. Those are really important attributes. Those are what make good bosses, according to this latest research that I've conducted, of uh, from 197 global leaders in 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 15 different countries in 30 companies. Yeah. Okay, so that's why this becomes so important, self-awareness. How do you re re improve your self-awareness? First thing that you start with, okay, so you know what? I have a lot more to share with you, but I ran out of time. So let me tell you a little bit about then the what to do from here on out. Okay, what to do? Self-management. Meaning it starts with self-awareness. It starts with your body. This could be an esoteric concept for some, some of you because we are so disconnected from our bodies. Our bodies send signals all the time. When we're connected with our bodies, and because it, it's trying to tell you something, when you feel a little blip, for example, okay, that means there's something happened. Okay, how did I interpret what I just saw? That, it's an invitation to you when you feel a blip, or sometimes it's a boom, explosion. But something happens inside of you. You can feel it, the physical sensation. Typically from here, between here and here. It's, it's, it occurs in your core. When you feel that little blip or explosion, whatever happening, that something is happening inside of you. It's trying to send you a signal. This is not safe. Pay attention. That's when you take a step back, literally just take a step back and say, okay, what just happened? What did I see? What did I hear? How did I interpret it? Those are the three questions you need to ask. And you make a choice, conscious choice. How do I want to interpret it? OK? And facilitate instead of control. The role of bosses have cha um, it has changed dramatically. The environment has changed so much. That there's too many things happening in the environment. One superstar can no longer control and manage and excel in everything there uh, in the organization. You have to delegate. You have to trust your people. Things have changed. It's just things are too complex now. So the role of your uh, of uh, leadership now is not command and control. It's facilitate and coordinate. Okay. And number one most important job for bosses, the leader, is creating safety. Number two most important job, creating belonging and connection. Why is that? Creating safety. If your reptilian brain gets in the way, it's, it's the end of the game. You're not going to be able to use best uh, capabilities of your people. You can't. They have to feel safe. Once the safety is established, then they need to feel belonged, and they need to feel part of the community, the connection. They need to, and then you can unleash all that stuff that's the gift that's buried in the prefrontal cortex. OK? Grow and groom your people, and choose your belief consciously. Think about what's happening in your body, how you interpret it, and then you make a choice, conscious choice, instead of going by your automatic you know, uh, program. And this, one, this is one um, exercise that I want to do with you. I want you to envision your best possible self and goal. Visualize a goal that you want to accomplish in life. In your career, in life, just pick one goal. Visualize it. Do you have it? It has to be visuali visualized. It has to, you, have to, you have to see it in your mind. See it. Think about how you look, what you're wearing, where you are, how you feel, what you're doing when you achieve that goal. Now make it bigger.
make it even bigger. Make it even bigger, three times bigger. Okay, so if you start out with the goal of, okay, I want to be a, um, uh, what's, what's, a, what's a goal, what's a good goal? Somebody shout out, what's a goal? You want to be a painter, okay? So how do you make it bigger? How do you make a, the, you all help out. How do you make a, a, the goal of being a good painter bigger? Art show, what else? What else? You envision yourself selling painting. Okay, selling painting. Getting really big and then you, um, and what else? Textbooks. Get in textbooks, awesome. Okay, so now make it even bigger. Now you're doing international things. Make it even bigger. You see what, what I'm doing? Once you set a goal that you think is slightly beyond your capacity, your reach, go through this exercise three times bigger. And your brain will reorganize itself to deliver on that belief. Okay? Let me say that one more time. When you hold a certain, certain belief, your brain will reorganize itself to deliver on that belief. Effectively, it's changing its filters so that you can actually deliver on what you're seeing, what you want to. Okay? So, my message here tonight is that we are naturally born leaders as women. We have God-given talents and capabilities that are already built in us. We haven't allowed, given ourselves permission to become good leaders because we've been stifled under social conditioning, limited beliefs that says, oh, you can only go so far. You don't deserve more than that. It doesn't have to be through a career or a job. It doesn't have to be. But it is so important for you to fully realize your full potential that's in you. In you. My challenge to you here tonight here is that think about the question, how can I become a better leader that leaves a greater impact on humanity? Thank you for the opportunity. And if you want, you can connect, me, connect with me on Facebook. Thank you for your time.